Hi, welcome to Sydney Life Church Online. We're so glad you joined us today. We pray that this sermon encourages and strengthens you. Hi there. So glad to be with you again and thank you for viewing. We really appreciate uh, you tuning into us every week. Uh, I want to talk about God's purpose in crisis. I mean, we've just gone through and uh, we're still to some extent going through this uh, this crisis. And so we have to ask the question then, what is God's purpose in crisis? Uh, what are we going to get out of this? Well, number one is this, that God is not surprised by this. Um, it didn't come as a surprise. It came as a surprise to everybody else, but God was not surprised by it. And the second thing is that God allowed it to happen. It doesn't mean that God sent it, but God allowed it to happen. And so uh, there, 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 there must be some purpose then for all of this happening. Now, what we've got to do is we've got to try and find out the purpose of uh, what are we going to get out of this as, as believers in Christ? What is the church going to get out of this? Because there's got to be something. And I want to read to you uh, Romans 8.28, which I know you're familiar with, but let me read this to you in two translations. First of all, in the King James, it says, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, called according to his purpose. And then in the uh, message translation, it says, that's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God has worked into something good. And so whatever it is that we're going through, whether it's individually or whether it's globally, which is an unusual circumstance, there is always some purpose in it. And especially, I believe, at this time, there is something we can discover in this. What I'm trying to say is, as I opened up, that even in crisis, there is purpose. So, you know, we, we, uh, we're reminded of the scriptures in, uh, in Joshua when um, it's time to leave Egypt and so God has some specific instructions and he basically said, my servant Moses is dead. Now you arise and you go over and you take the inheritance that I've given to you. And I was thinking about that in relation to, in context to the church right now. I almost feel like God is saying, this is a, a transitional time. And I want you to leave Egypt as it were, in other words, Leave the place of familiarities, leave the place that you've been in for so long, the church, and move into promised land, move into an inheritance that I have ordained for you, something that you've never actually taken before. Because God's basically saying, as the inheritance is in the other side of the, the Jordan River, so the church's inheritance is there for us as we cross out of this coronavirus crisis. And actually we're moving into another one, which I'll, I will address next week, which is the financial one. But God is saying something specific. And God is saying, if you want to possess the land, if you want the inheritance, the inheritance is not on this side. The inheritance is on that side, which means then that we've actually got to say, okay, now God, the purpose on all of this surely has got to be that you've got something for us on the other side of the coronavirus. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So, you know, when I was preparing um, the sermon this week, I, I felt drawn, I didn't really understand it. I felt drawn to the prodigal son. And I'm just going to paraphrase this and really get to what I want to say, but I'll paraphrase it first. Guy had a couple of sons, right? And uh, it's in, in Luke chapter 15. It says he had two sons. And when I looked at that, I thought, wow, two sons, two choices. Each son has a choice. Every individual is a choice to make. And so the one son, as we know the story, he came to his father and he said, look, give me what is, is mine. Give me my inheritance. So the father said, okay, I've, I've given it to you. Just like the father has said to the church, there is an inheritance for you that I've already given you. So you have to take it. But it's what do you do with the inheritance once you take it? So anyway, <clears throat> the son the younger son, he took his inheritance and we know that he, he moved into another country and he squandered what the father had given him. He did not steward what God had given him. And this is something that I believe God's saying to us in this season, is that God has given us so much and there is so much right now that God is offering the church as we move into this new place, our promised land as it were, on the other side of 
coronavirus. There is so much that God, I believe, has got for the church. So the question is not, is it available? The question is, what are we going to do with it once we get it? Are we going to steward it? The young man went and he squandered everything. And uh, he went to another land, an unfamiliar land. In a sense, he went to the world system. And there he just squandered what the Father had given him. And so I guess we, we have to take stock and say, well, God, we don't want to squander what you've given us as born-again believers. You've given us so much. Some people may be watching this and don't even think that God has given them anything, but I can assure you that God has given you so much. It's actually there. You just have to be a good steward of what God has given you. And so the story goes that he ended up with a swine and he had to eat what the swine was eating and he was hungry. And then <clears throat> the scripture says that um, in Luke 17 verses 17 and 18, it says, but when he came to himself, in other words, he must have looked around and says, gee, this is crazy. What am I doing here? My father has given me so much and yet I've done nothing worth it. And now here I am with the swine and I, I've got to basically be content with the world system this terrible system, because I haven't taken what God gave me to take. Now, I am not in any way, you know, trying to get down in anybody. What I'm saying is I'm trying to encourage you saying, I'm not saying you've went and squandered, but what I'm saying is that we've got to take stock of what the Father has given us in this season. There is things that we've got to pick up. There is dormant gifts inside you that you've got to pick up and run with in this season. There are dreams that God has given you and yet you've never done anything with them. God is saying, pick these things up and run with them and use them against the world system. Use them for the kingdom of God. It says he came to himself. He realized in his mind, he thought, wow, this is not right. Um, there's an exciting kingdom which I'm not part of anymore. My father's kingdom, there is so much, there's so much provision in my father's kingdom and yet here I am with a swine and I want to encourage you that there's so much in the father's kingdom for you and God's saying arise arise go over Jordan move into the promises that I've given you because the next season of what God is going to do is going to be so exciting people are going to write books about this next season there's going to be such an outpouring of God's spirit. And so we'll move on quickly with the story because I want to get to the really good part of this. And it says in Luke 15 and verse 20, and, and so the young man eventually he came home and it says, and when he arose, he came to his father, but when he was a, still a, a great way off, in other words, the father was looking for him. The father was waiting for, for him a long way off. It says, and the father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell in his neck and kissed him. And then uh, there was great celebration going on. And so get ready for a great move of, yeah, there, there will be a lot of prodigal sons. I'm not just teaching about prodigal sons in this, but there will be prodigal sons that will come back. But I'm teaching about those in the church who've just been dormant. That there, is a, there is a stirring going on right now. The Holy Spirit is busy in your life. And I don't care if you're full-time ministry or not. I'm speaking to me, I'm speaking to you. That there is something going on right now where the Holy Spirit is stirring us up as we move into post-COVID-19. So get ready for great celebration in the Father's house. And it's based on a revelation that the Son realized, wow, my focus has been wrong. My focus has been not on the Father. My focus has been not on the Father's house. My focus was, was just on what I could get from Him and misuse it. But that's gonna, now it's going to be a new day is basically what He was saying. It's one of the saddest stories in the Bible, this, because it says that the older son, and I'll read it to you. Now, the older son was in the field, and he came and he drew near to the house, and he heard the music and the dancing. So he called one of the servants and said, what do these things mean? What's going on? And he said to him, your brother is coming because he has received him safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatted calf. Now, what's sad about this is the older son lived in the father's house, but he did not know the father's ways. He could not interpret why there was such music and dancing and celebration going on in his father's house. And so he was not intimate with the father. He didn't know the father's character, although he was, could we say he was in the church? 
Um, he didn't know how the father would react. We have to be intimate with God in these times. We have to be so intimate with the Father that we know, <clears throat> we know the next move. We know what's going to happen. We can anticipate this next move of God. We know what the Father's going to do next. And you can feel that in your spirit. That doesn't mean you have to be a prophet. It doesn't mean you have to go and win the world for Jesus. But what it does mean is to be aware of what the Father has got for you in this season. I want to read this to you. Um, from the New Living Translation. It says, he revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. And so Moses was a man that God spoke to face to face. And because he knew him like that, it says there that he revealed his character to Moses. Yeah, this is one of the things I believe that God wants to do first and foremost, is to reveal his character to us. And so what are we getting from this? What is the purpose in this crisis? It's adjustment. It's adjustment. And I'll go through a few points, practical points, and I want to talk regarding the church. Number one is the church no longer can just get together for um, just for fellowship. We've got to get together. Obviously, we go to church and we get fed, yes, but I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But we don't just go for, for the fellowship. We, we've got to go for encouragement. We've got to encourage one another. We've got to love one another in the house of God. That's why we get together. That is an important point that we've actually been stopped through this virus, uh, been, been, been able to, not been able to, to encourage one another. And the Bible talks about this so very strongly, and it says in Hebrews 10, 25 in the Amplified, not forsaking our meeting together as believers for as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more faithfully as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. In the message translation, it says, let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. That's a reference to the day of Christ. Now, <clears throat> what I'm saying by that is this. We've got to come to church with an excitement that we can actually minister to one another. Encouragement, testimony, healing. We've got to encourage. There's got to be a spirit of encouragement that operates in the church. So we cannot go back to church as usual. Now, I'm not saying that you haven't been. I'm saying think about this and do it all the more. Number two, we go to church not just to hear teaching. We go to church, and this is another adjustment. We've got to start applying the stuff that we've been taught. In James 1, 22 to 24, in the message, listen to this. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you're a listener when you are anything but letting the Word of God go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear. Those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in a mirror, walk away, and, the two, and two minutes later, later, they have no idea of who they are or what they look like. Well, wow, that's, that's a very powerful scripture because it's saying, don't keep going to church and just getting fed and going away and forgetting what you've just heard. In other words, take what you've heard. And I have, I've taught this in my church recently. Take what, even if it's just one point you get, take that one point and say, I'm going to apply that this next week. Um, and so what I'm saying by that is this is a season of equipping. So, so, but the, you know, we often think about equipping. Well, we've got to equip the saints. Yeah, that, that's true. But the saints are actually the ones who equip themselves. We teach them as leadership, but then the saints take that stuff and by implementing, they actually are equipping themselves. So the onus, the onus is first of all on, on, on the leadership to teach. But the second part equally on that is whoever's listening is to take that and then equip themselves by actually doing what they've just heard. So, so important. So that we become producers and not consumers. So what has God taught you through the crisis then? Well, you need to think about that because God's saying something, right? I mean, like I said weeks ago that we don't let a crisis go without finding out what God's saying and how we can make adjustments. The, the, the next point I want to talk about is where the, the adjustments have, have got to come, is that we've got to be very, very, very Christ 
centered. Not man centered, not circumstance centered. Hebrew 12 and verse 2, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So this is a season, please, I'm, 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 I'm saying this to me, I'm saying, Tom, you know, this is a season where I've got to stay focused on God. I cannot be focused on what's happening out there in the world. I don't deny it, but I've got to be focused more in God than anything else. Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. In other words, he's saying, listen, I, I know there's a lot of stuff happening. I know that your mind has gone a hundred ways, but if you look to me, what I've begun in you, I'm going to complete. And by the way, he's not finished. And for a lot of you, he's just starting. I believe this is a new season for all of us in a sense. So that's important. It, and I love this uh, Psalm 34 and verse five. They looked to him and they were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. I'm telling you in this next season, you will not be ashamed as you look towards God. The Amplified says, they looked to him and were radiant. Their faces will never blush in shame or confusion. No more confusion. You're not going to be confused and confess that. You're not going to be confused. The next thing is worship. A uh, God consciousness. Th this is something in this next season that we're going to be, we're going to have to be aware of. Not just worship on Sundays, but conscious of God all the time and responding to that consciousness. And that's really what worship is. Psalm 34, 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. When praise is continual in your mouth, it's only because God is continu continual in your mind. So we're going to have to become so focused in God. And then <clears throat> prayer has to be a priority. I'm nearly finished. Prayer has got to be a priority. In Psalm 91, verse 14 and 16, you'll see that there. It says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him in high because he has known my name. Then it says in verse 15, he shall call upon me, that's prayer, and I will answer him. So you're in a secret place, secret place. God says, as you're in that secret place, I'm going to be listening to what you say. I'm going to answer your prayer. He says, I will be with him in trouble. Wow. In other words, there was trouble all around us. It's not going to get any better. We will get through this coronavirus thing. We will get through this financial thing. But, but we're living in troubled times. And so God's saying, I will deliver you and I will answer your prayers. Expect your prayers, your outrageous prayers to be answered in times like this. Be outrageous with your prayers. Be extravagant with your prayers. Because if you're in the secret place, if you're in a place where you say, I do love God, then God is going to answer your prayers. And then the last one I want to talk about is always, this should be the first one, but I thought I would emphasize it a little more. Number one, more than anything else, is your priority and my priority has always got to be God's word. It says in Psalm 119, verse 25, my soul clings to the dust, revive me according to your word. I'm not talking about just revival. I'm talking about the individual being revived. Revive me according to your word. Let your word, according to what I read, according to what I meditate on, let that be the measure of my revival. You cannot look at somebody else and say, oh, well, revival's happening over there. I'm just going to go over there and get a touch of revival. No, no, that's not what we're talking about in this season. We're talking about you personally being revived. Revival is for you personally, and the Word of God is the only way for that to happen. It says in Psalm 119, verse 37, Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me according to your way. In other words, the Word of God will revive you and protect you from idle worship. What I mean by idol worship is not that you're sitting with a little statue in front of you, a little Buddha or anything like that, but idol worship is anything that takes your attention primarily of God and puts it in other things. So that is a focus of adjustment that God is making in this time. And then this is where you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you. And so God wants us to be revived in such a way that we rejoice in Him. So it is a season of change. I, I'm, honestly, I feel this so strong. It is a season of transition that we're moving into as we leave COVID-19 behind and we move into the inheritance that God has got for us. And you know, when we look back, we're going to say, you know what? That was a terrible time. And we are so sad that so many people lost their lives. 
But God, are you saying something to me in this? Is there something I've got to get out of this? And God is saying, yes, I want you to be stronger. I want you to be faithful. I want you to be more in tune with me. I want you to embrace me more intimately so that I can use you. That when the next problem comes, and problems will come, that you can be so strong and so mightily used of God to encourage and deliver others. God bless you. As we take up the offering this morning, I want to read to you from um, the book of Philippians chapter 4. And um, I'm going to read to you from the Amplified Bible in verses 19, 18 and 19. And it says there, But I have received everything in full and more. I am amply supplied, having received from Ephroditus the gifts you sent me. They are the fragrant aroma of an offering, an acceptable sacrifice, which God welcomes and in which he delights. And my God will liberally supply, fill until full, your every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. A w wonderful version, isn't it? But really what I want to bring out here this morning is that our, our offerings to God are um, an acceptable sacrifice. In other words, you can actually separate your giving to God and your worship of God. The two of them are the same thing. In other words, if, you're, if your offerings are done in a worshipful way, they're acceptable to God as a sweet aroma. So we just don't give because we've been told to give. We, we give in a worshipful way. It's a pleasure to give to God. Because remember, you know, we, we are, we, yes, we are giving to the church, but really um, it is God that is receiving. So we're giving to the church, but God is actually receiving the gift as an act of worship. So I want to encourage you with that today, that as you, as you give, um, see it as an act of your worship to God that is a sweet smelling aroma to Him. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed that sermon. Thanks for joining us. If you want to find out more about us, don't forget to check us out on our social media platforms or visit our website. Also, if you have any prayer requests or testimonies, we'd love to hear them. We'll see you next time.